the opportunity to come to any annual is precious. The opportunity to come back to the squadron and I have the privilege of commanding is super special. I've been to, this is my 11th annual that I've gotten to come to in the last couple of years. And I, I purposely stayed away from the 344th because I wanted to make sure it felt right that, that I was invited back. And so when Master Sergeant Betts reached out to me uh, a few months ago and, and asked if I'd be uh, wanting to come back, I said absolutely. The, what's that? Panthers for life. Panthers for life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean that. I, I I regularly go out and say, you know what? At the headquarters, you're not supposed to pick favorite children amongst the 32 squadrons. But let's get real. This is my favorite child by far. Yeah. By far. Right? <laughs> this will always, always be uh, my squadron and, and my favorite place to be. So so being up here on stage tonight is, is truly uh, a treat for, for me. And so as I, as I go through all these annuals, uh, they regularly have old guys and gals come up and speak, right? give those pearls of wisdom, and they, they, they talk about the good old days. And so I guess now officially that I'm an old guy, I don't want to get up here and disappoint and not tell you some old stories from back in the day. All right? So there I was. <laughs> September of 1994, and I was a freshly minted first lieutenant, and I was standing in a deployment line at Herbert Field, Florida. And I was in the deployment line getting ready for my first ever deployment to go over to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And I was going to go up with some special ops forces in advance of moving into Fort Prince, Haiti, for Operation Restore Democracy when they're having all kinds of trouble down there. So they're deploying us to Guantanamo Bay to a hangar to sleep on cots for a few weeks. And so I'm all excited, right? They put us in the deployment line. And some of you have run deployment lines. A lot of you have been in deployment lines. You stand in the long line, making sure you get all your supplies and all your medical stuff gets checked out. So I'm working down the line. We get to the medical tech, the med tech. And he looks up at me and he goes, Lieutenant, just need to see your shot record. So back in the day, and the old times will remember this. Shop records were hard copy, right? So you had to have your hard copy shop yep. record. And they told you when you got in the Air Force, don't ever lose your shop record, because <laughs> this is your only proof that you've ever had shots. I still got one. Still you still have, have your yellow shop record. Just in case. Yeah, yeah well, needless to say, I don't. <laughs> All right? And I found out the hard way in September of 1994 that I did. All right? So on very short notice, we were told to deploy it. And, and I was searching high and low for this darn shop record. I sure had it, but I didn't. So I went to the med tech and I fessed up. Uh, Sir, can I see your shop record? I don't have it. What do you mean you don't have it? I, I just couldn't find it. So he looks over his shoulder and this, this burly guy, Sergeant Smith, just kind of nods at him like he's the bouncer. And they said, well, we're gonna take care of you, Lieutenant. Don't worry, you go with Sergeant Smith to the special room. And so they take me in the back. Because normally, uh, uh, going to the Caribbean, you're going to get just a couple shots just to square you away. Well, Sergeant Smith takes me back to the special room, and I said, so, so what, what happens now? And he <coughs> said, well, you don't have a shot record, so there's no proof of you ever having any vaccinations in your career. He says, so you're going to get the full menu, the whole buffet. And I said, so what does that mean? He goes, well, we're going to distribute three shots in your left arm and three shots in your right arm and then give you the gammy glob and jello, jello shot in your, in your uh, gluteus. And so I said, well, let's do it then. And so boom, three there, three there, and one there. And then six hours later, I was able to report back to catch a C-141 with everybody over at Guantanamo Bay. So I was like, yeah, that felt good. That wasn't so big a deal. You know, I'm feeling all right. So I walk out and go home, pack, and get everything ready. Six hours later, it's nighttime, we report back to the flight line. I'm like, oh my God, my arms, they're hanging heavy, like 100 pounds each. The three shots had taken its course, the game blob had run its course, and it was the most miserable four hour flight over to, to Cuba that, that, uh, that I've ever had in my life. So there were two lessons I learned that day. One was don't ever lose your shot record, and congratulations, BD, I'm happy to shot record all these years later. And two was you never want to go to the special room with Sergeant Smith. Never. <laughs> So those were big lessons, and that's my back-in-the-day story. All right. So in the Air Force, one of the great things that we get to learn from is 
mentorship. All right, and so we get mentorship every day, but we especially get mentorship from commanders. We get mentorship from chiefs. We get mentorship from our flight chiefs. And oftentimes that mentorship comes in the form of how are you gonna leave your mark? How are you gonna make a difference? What's your legacy gonna be? And sometimes that's, well, gold badge, silver badge, uh, NCO recorder, perhaps standard of excellence, a promotion. It means a little bit different to all of us depending on our situations. We all come from different backgrounds. We all come from different experiences. And so that's what I love about the Air Force is that diversity and just a different way of thinking, okay? And so tonight I wanna to tell you about what making a difference means to me. All right, so to do that, I'm gonna take you back to 1937, four years before we entered World War II. And that was where my father was born. And my father uh, had a pretty hard upbringing. Uh, his father, my grandfather, was a construction engineer. And so my grandfather, Paul McKenna, would go all across the country taking jobs in construction to, to pay the bills. And so my dad's family, it was him and his sister, his mom and dad, would move all over. They went from Pennsylvania, where he was born, down to Louisiana, uh, over, over to Mississippi, up to Kentucky, up to Indiana, down to Tennessee, and then up to Ohio. So when all was said and done, when my dad graduated high school, 12 years of schooling, he had gone to 15 different schools. And oftentimes lived in a hitch trailer that was pulled uh, by the car that the family uh, drove all over those places. And he decided when he graduated high school that he wanted something better for himself. That he wanted something better for the family that he didn't yet have. And so you fast forward to April of 1963. And my father is a billboard painter outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But back in the day, they didn't just put big sheets up for billboards. They actually had to hand paint everything on every billboard. So my dad was a talented artist, and he painted billboards all through the Midwestern United States. And so this day in April 1963, he's painting his billboard on side of Pittsburgh, Ohio, and he looks across the highway there, and he sees an Armed Forces Recruiting Center. Hadn't given him a thought to join the military before. His father wasn't in the military. His grandfather wasn't in the military. Hadn't given him a thought to it, but he saw an Armed Forces Recruiting Center. He got to think of all his pain. So the next day he comes back, Finishes, you know, to finish the billboard, looks across the highway, there's that Armed Forces Recruiting Center, and gets some more. So he goes back home, talks to his wife, my mom, who at the time is 20 years old, already has a one-year-old daughter, has uh, my brother, a son on the way, and they, and they make a family decision. So next morning, my dad gets dressed up, heads out to the Armed Forces Recruiting Center. And it's there that he meets Tech Sergeant Philip Joyce. Philip Joyce changes his life and changes my family's history. If it weren't for Tech Sergeant Philip Joyce, I wouldn't be standing up here speaking to you tonight. I wouldn't be Colonel Sean McKenna having all of the benefits that had come with the decision that was made that day. So I adore my father. He's 82 years old in a couple of months. And all of the important things I've learned in life, really I've learned from him, all right? He went that summer to Latin, did a couple of tours in Vietnam, went on to officer training school, and went on to serve in the Air Force for 27 years. He got to see the world. He got to raise a great family, five kids, all get advanced degrees from college, uh, learn the importance of integrity, diversity, what hard work really means. And it's all because of that Tech Sergeant Philip Joyce giving him a chance at one day in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so I'm grateful because that decision of my father led to me deciding to join the United States Air Force. It 
that led to my brother Pat serving for 14 years in the United States Air Force. And I think back to Tech Sergeant Philip Joyce. This would be the Hollywood moment where 90 year old Philip Joyce would walk in the door, right? <laughs> I don't know where Philip Joyce is. I don't know if, if he's even still alive. But he has to know that he touched countless, countless lives. He's still touching countless lives. He's touching my life right now, right here. And you're doing the exact same thing. By my count, you, you brought in over 1,500 airmen this year. You're touching their lives. And 50 years from now, you're gonna be touching those grandkids' lives because of what you've done collectively across the squadron. But it's not just what you do with the recruits, because that is job one, but it's what you do with each other in this room that really matters too. The impact that we have on each other that defines your legacy as well. Because your legacy is not status or rank, okay? It, it has nothing to do with rank. Just because I'm a colonel doesn't make me important, okay? There's a lot of colonels and chiefs in the United States Air Force who have had little to no impact on their airmen's lives, okay? There have been a lot of generals in the United States Air Force that have little impact on their airmen's lives, okay? And so what you have to realize is that it's not what you are, it's, it's who you are, and how you affect the people sitting across from you every single day, changing their lives for the better, reaching deep and affecting them. And that's what's important to me. That's what really matters. Because at the end of the day, you know, I'm Sean McKen. I'm not Colonel Sean McKen. I'm Sean McKen. And no matter if I was a colonel or a major or a captain or a staff sergeant, I'm still Sean McKen. I'm still the same person inside. That's not changing. All right, I'm lucky to make colonel. You know, there's some things that fell my way. And I was very fortunate to be able to, to capitalize on that. I think those of us who are senior leaders in this room would say the same thing. That we were very fortunate to be in these positions of leadership, but it could have been anybody. It could have been anybody. But really, what really defines us, what really defines us is what we have inside. It's not what's here. It's not what's here. It's what's here and here that defines us. And we all make an impact. We can all pick each other up and leave that mark that is so darn important. That, to me, is, is, is the measure of success. And so, while it's really cool to be a colonel, it is, I'll admit it, it's really cool to be a colonel. My dad, 82-year-old Jerry McKenna, brags about it to, my, to his friends a lot, because I uh, technically outrank him. That's not the measure of success. It's the impact we have on each other's lives and it's the gift that keeps on giving. I've had the good fortune over the years to be invited to preside over the promotion or the retirement ceremonies for a lot of fellow airmen. I've been invited to attend their weddings. I've been invited to attend their children's graduation, BMT graduation ceremonies. And the reason why that's such a privilege is because they could ask anybody to do that. And yet, somehow they reach back to me and they ask me to be involved in that. And to me, I look at that as, as that's, that's the difference you want to leave on each other, is be connected. Is when we're all old and gray, we're all still connected because of this thing we call the United States Air Force. And that's the legacy that we all leave for each other. And right now, there's people in this room. There's absolutely people in this room are doing wonderful things and leaving a legacy. I mentioned the 1,500 airmen. It goes without saying that you have given them and their families such a wonderful opportunity in life. And that's gonna carry on to their sons and daughters and to their grandkids. And it's gonna keep going 100 years from now. When we're long gone, there's gonna be people still serving in the United States Air Force because of the actions that you took this week of what you did this week to put that airman in the United States Air Force. And I, and I want you to realize that that's a huge legacy that, that, that you're leaving. And so when I look back on the fact 
that I follow in the footsteps of my father, those are huge footsteps. And, and yes, it's a fact that I do outrank him, but it'll take a lifetime to be able to match what, what he did, the lives that he touched, the legacy that he has left. And I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that, that, that the name that I wear on my uniform, the name that he gave me, is lived up to by the character and the actions that, that I produce. And so when you look back on your career, whether you've been here for five years, 10 years, whether like Chief Lane, you're coming to the, to the end of this chapter and moving on to the next, be very proud of the contributions that you've made already and will continue to make because it matters. It, it, it's, it's a huge, you are a difference maker. There's people in this room right now who have made a huge difference in my life, all right? They've made me a better person. They've picked me up when I stumbled. They've made me a stronger leader. And you know who you are. It's Katie York. Ashley Betts, KG, those are the folks that at the end of all of this, that's who matters, is, is each other, and, and working with each other, and making a difference in each other's lives. And so, be the difference maker. You know, this is such a noble calling to be able to bring people into the United States Air Force and to serve for 20, 30 years and change lives. So that noble calling that is a legacy of someone like Tech Sergeant Philip Joyce, who just happened to bring my father, a billboard painter, in 56 years ago, and that four-year hitch turned into a 27-year career and, and led to me being privileged to have a 27-year career. As I say, it's the, the gift that keeps on giving. So I can't thank you enough for what you do and what you keep on doing. And I'm just so proud to be counted amongst the alum for the 344 Panthers. And I hope that for the rest of my life we'll be connected because of what we've been able to do. So thank you and go Panthers.